they persevered as they put faith in God and turned to their Bible for guidance, learning that a relationship requires sacrificial love and unselfish compromises. And they strengthened their relationship with tender caring, sweet comfort, and loving compassion. After 236 days, 6 hours, 31 minutes, and 77 seconds, they decided that they wanted to be an intimate part of each other's lives for as long as they both shall live. After 312 days, they are ready to continue into a new chapter as husband and wife. together before God in holy marriage. Marriage is an institution of God, uh, blessed by our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's appropriate that this service be a service of worship to God. So let us begin by bowing in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity where we can come and witness the marriage of Exon and Lindsay. We ask that you would bless this time. We commit it to you thankful that you're the one who ordains each of our days, even before we know one of them. Be with us now, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Holy Scriptures speak of marriage as both individuals leave their families and cleave to one another and become one. Who then gives this woman to be married to this man? I do. Please be seated. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the cattle of, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him, and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the, the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Good afternoon. Um, I have the distinct privilege this afternoon of entering into the Lord's life. We seek to understand more deeply what marriage is what marriage is about according to God's purpose and God's design. So this afternoon we're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. The Apostle Paul writes, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. 
He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this afternoon, and we praise you and thank you for the event that is bringing us all together today. We thank you that we get to witness this covenant of marriage between Exit and Lindsay, and we thank you for their desire, their love, and their their commitment to each other this this afternoon. And we just pray, Father, that as we look at your word, that you'd give us wisdom and understanding, that you'd help us all to understand in a more real way the deep and profound, wonderful meaning of marriage and why you have given us this wonderful, blessed covenant. We pray for your blessing over this time. In Christ's name, amen. Contrary to what many people might think, um, marriage is not the result of societal evolution. It is not some construct of uh, society in order to better serve uh, the good of society. Marriage is instead part of God's intended plan for his creation. Uh, We read in Genesis that from the very beginning, God created man and woman as an expression of his glory. And so therefore, as his creation, it is it is our goal, it is our, our purpose to, to make known the greatness and the glory of God to this world. One of the ways that he's given us to do this is through marriage. But we read later on in Genesis that it isn't good that Adam was alone in the garden. So God created Eve. And he said, therefore, that the man shall leave his father and mother and shall hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Our Lord Jesus Christ, as we read from Matthew this morning, he reiterates that that timeless truth when the Pharisees come and challenge him about divorce. And Jesus adds on to that that what God has brought together, no man is to separate. And so understanding that that marriage is part of God's intention, part of his plan for his creation, it stands to reason that marriage has a purpose. And if marriage has a purpose that's part of God's design and plan for his creation, then stands to reason that we might want to understand that purpose. In this passage, Ephesians 5, 22 through 23, the Apostle Paul shows us the deep and meaningful purpose of marriage. It's important that we understand that marriage does have a purpose. And it's a purpose that goes far beyond procreation or even companionship. It's a purpose that goes far beyond uh, mutual satisfaction or even personal happiness. And it's important, Exon and Lindsay, that that you understand this as you enter into marriage. That the meaning of marriage goes far, far beyond these things. Because you see, if we fail to understand the purpose of marriage, if we fail to grasp that, then we fail to understand what it is that holds a marriage together. You see, if we think that marriage is mainly about personal happiness, then when times come when you aren't happy, you begin to wonder what's wrong with your marriage, possibly even what's wrong with your spouse. If you think that marriage is mainly about procreation or having children, what what happens if you don't have children? Or even worse, what happens if you do have children and then your children leave the house? What is left to support and to hold up your marriage? You see, if you think marriage is mainly about mutual satisfaction, then what happens when you aren't satisfied? And you think that possibly somebody else might satisfy you more. Because you see, the the hard truth here is that your marriage is going to face difficult times. I'd like to stand here and tell you that from this point on, it's just like marital bliss, and you're floating on clouds for the rest of your life, but that would be a lie, and I'd be in a lot of trouble for saying that. Because the truth is that marriage is difficult. When my wife and I got married, um, I asked my mother if she could tell me one thing, one thing about marriage, what would that be? And she said, she, she told me that uh, marriage is work. It's hard work. And so those moments where your marriage hits difficult times, it's in those moments that understanding the importance of marriage, the purpose of marriage, will help you sustain and shape your marriage to endure and to persevere. So we see that understanding the purpose of marriage is paramount to the longevity 
and the happiness of our marriage. So we ask, what is the purpose that the Apostle Paul is pointing us to today in this text? Well, as we look at this, this passage here in Ephesians 5, 22-33, the Apostle Paul is giving for us a biblical framework for husband and wife relationships. But what we need to understand first is that not just our husband and wife relationships, but all relationships that we have are to be framed and understood in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, we can't come into Ephesians 5, 22 through 33 and just kind of rip it out of context. We have to understand it within the, the larger context of this letter that Paul is writing, within the larger context of the argument that Paul is putting forward. So if we look back at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 1 and 2, we read this. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You see, the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf is to frame our understanding of how we are to live and to interact with everyone around us. So, as we come to Ephesians 5, 22 and 33, where Paul is speaking specifically to husbands and wives, we need to understand that the gospel is to be the grounding for all of our relationships. The truth that Jesus Christ came in human flesh, God in human flesh, that he came and he lived a perfectly righteous life, and that he went to the cross on our behalf as a substitutionary atonement to die on our behalf so that sinners who rightly deserve the wrath of God could have forgiveness through repentance and faith. This truth, the gospel, must frame our understanding and shape all of our interactions and relationships. This becomes even more emphasized when we see that Paul states that the purpose of marriage is to make known the truth of the gospel. If you look at verse 32, Paul says, This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. The mystery that Paul is speaking about is the mystery of marriage. Now, when Paul calls marriage a mystery, he's not saying that it's some hidden thing, some uh, undefined reality, but rather, the word mystery here means that there's a deeper meaning to it than appears just on the surface. And Paul says that the deeper meaning to marriage is that it refers to Christ in the church. What he means here is that marriage is meant to be a living, breathing example of Christ and his saving love, care, and affection for his people. So the deeper meaning of marriage is that marriage is meant to display the gospel. Your marriage, as you come together, its, it's grand purpose, its grand design is to make known to the world around you the wonderful truth of the gospel, to be a living, breathing example of Christ's deep love and affection for his people. That's a heavy task. It's a heavy burden. We ask ourselves, how in the world, how can we fulfill such a purpose? How can we live a life that makes known this great and wonderful truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Paul tells us how. Paul explains that as a husband and a wife relate to each other in a biblical way, you make known the gospel through your marriage. So what I want us to do this morning, just a few moments, is I want us to look at how Paul is calling husbands and wives to relate to one another and how that makes known the wonderful truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul begins first by speaking to the wife. In verses 22 through 24, Paul writes, Wives, Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Paul's call on the wife here in this text is to be submissive to her husband. That word submissive means to bring yourself under the leadership of someone else. So what the text is calling us here to, or Lindsay, what the text is calling you to as the wife is to joyfully, willingly, Bring yourself under the leadership of Exon as he seeks to lead your home in a godly way. You are to come alongside of him, and as Genesis says, to be a helper suitable, one who helps him and assists him as he seeks to lead your family, to follow Christ, to know Christ, and to make Christ known. Paul says a wonderful thing happens here as you do this. As you do this, as you joyfully, willingly come under the leadership of Exon, what you are doing is you're making known the relationship of the church to Christ. You're showing how we, the church, 
joyfully, willingly come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, obedient to our Savior. Paul then turns his attention to the husband. And we might notice that the bulk of the verses speak to you as the husband. And now, I hate to burst your bubble, but this does not speak to your vast importance over and above your wife. It doesn't mean that you're, you know, that much better. What it speaks to is it speaks to the weightiness of the task that's given to you as the husband. And so Paul writes in verses 25 through 30, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Verses 25 through 30, Paul is calling on you to love your wife as Christ loves the church. Now the simplicity of that statement disguises the deep meaning of it. Because if we start to contemplate the love of Christ for his church, we cannot avoid the cross. If we start to think about how Jesus Christ loves his people, our minds, our eyes, our thoughts are driven to the cross. They're driven to Golgotha. And we are reminded that Christ did not deserve death. That Christ never transgressed the law. Christ never sinned against his Father. He lived a life of perfect righteousness, and yet he marched to the cross. He walked to the cross, not to bear his own sin or to bear his own guilt, but he walked to the cross to bear the guilt and the sin of his people. This is the kind of love that a husband is called to have for his wife. It's a sacrificial love. And I want you to understand something so so important. that This this love goes so far beyond emotions and feelings. We see we live in in a world that has that has just torn apart the concept of the idea of true biblical love. And and we we boiled it down to this idea that love is is a fuzzy, bubbly feeling that comes up inside of me. And and if the fuzzy, bubbly feeling is not there, then certainly I don't have love. But that's not the biblical picture of love. The biblical picture of love is a willful decision to put the needs of someone else above your own. That is what we see in Christ and his love for his people. His willful decision to put the needs of his people above his own. And so he goes to the cross to bear our sin, to bear our guilt, to bear our shame, so that we might receive his righteousness, forgiveness. This is the love that you're called to have for your wife. To love her in a sacrificial way. As Paul says, to cherish her, to nourish her, to care for her, to love her as Christ loves his people. And Paul says a beautiful and wonderful thing happens when a husband loves his wife as Christ loves the church and when a wife brings herself under the leadership of of her husband. Paul says a wonderful and beautiful thing happens and that is that this marriage, this union, makes known the wonderful and beautiful truth of the gospel to the world. And I really want you guys to understand that this is the union you're entering into today. This is the covenant you're making with one another. You, as are promising to love her as Christ loves the church. And you, Lindsay, are promising to come under his leadership and to help him as he seeks to lead your family in a biblical way. And the two of you together are covenanting before the Lord to make known the greatness and glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ to all those who have an opportunity to see your marriage. It's a wonderful, beautiful meaning to marriage. It's a wonderful and beautiful opportunity to make known the great truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. So we see that the grand purpose of marriage is to make known the gospel. So that means that the glue that holds a marriage together must be the gospel. It must be Jesus Christ. Christ must be at the center not only of your individual lives, 
And I'm saying Christ must be at the center of your existence. He must be the, the blazing center around which you order your life. And Lindsay, Christ must be the blazing center of your life around which you order all things. But Christ must be the center of your marriage as well. Both of you together, in covenant and union, looking unto Jesus as your strength, as your support, as your encouragement. When those hard times come, to remind yourself that marriage goes far beyond the two of you. It makes known the wonderful, deep, and abiding truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A marriage that is built upon the gospel, a marriage that is built upon Christ, is a marriage that is ready to endure all the rigors, the joys, the ups, the downs of life. And so it's my prayer this morning for both of you that the two of you will have a marriage that glorifies and honors it. Christ, that the two of you will have a marriage that makes known the wonderful, beautiful truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that God will use your marriage to lead other people to salvation, to lead other people to see the wonder and beauty of Christ's love for his people. A marriage for us is nothing more beautiful than that. So if you would allow me this morning, I would like to pray over you. Pray that this might be the goal and the desire of your marriage. We pray. Father in heaven, I come before you and I praise you and thank you for the opportunity to be here. I thank you for Exit and Lindsay. I thank you for their desire to enter into this covenant together. And I pray, Father in heaven, that you would strengthen them and that you would encourage them. I pray, Lord, above all things that. Jesus Christ would be the center of their marriage. That together as husband and wife starting a new life together, they would set their eyes upon Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, and that they would run with endurance the race that is set before them. Father, I pray that when the hard times come, and they will come, that you would remind them of their commitment, that you would remind them of the gospel, that you would remind them of Christ and his sacrifice and his love for us. And in the midst of those difficult times and those hard times, they would be renewed, rejuvenated in their commitment and their love for one another. I pray over Lindsay that you would strengthen her and encourage her, help her to come under the leadership of Exon, to willingly and joyfully submit to his leadership. I pray for Exon, Father, that you would strengthen him and encourage him to love his wife as Christ, to love the church, to cherish her, to nourish her, to care for her. I pray, Father, in him, that you would use their marriage to make known the greatness and the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that through the testimony of their marriage, through the witness of their marriage, you might lead many people to salvation. I pray these things in Christ Jesus' name. So having reviewed what God has said about your union, it's now time to declare your consent to him. Exon, do you take Lindsay as your true and lawful wife? And God helping you, will you love, cherish, honor, and protect her? And forsaking all others, be faithful to her as long as you both shall live? I do. And Lindsay, do you take Exon as your true and lawful husband? And God helping you, will you love, cherish, honor, and obey him? And forsaking all others, be faithful to him as long as you both shall live. Amen. And you have dreams here for each other. Exon and Lindsay, you give these rings as a symbol of your eternal covenant and commitment to each other. Please repeat after me. In the presence of God and these witnesses, in the presence of God and these witnesses, I exon take you, Lindsay. I exon take you, Lindsay, to be my wife. To be my wife. To have and hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better or worse. For better or worse. For richer for poorer. For richer for poor. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love, cherish, honor, and protect. To 
love, cherish, honor, and protect. And until we are parted by death, until we are parted by death, this is my solemn vow. This is my solemn vow. Please repeat that. In the presence of God and these witnesses, I, Lindsay, take you, Exon, to be my husband, to have and hold from this day forward, for, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love, cherish, honor, and obey, until we are parted by death. This is my solemn vow. As we prepare to take this communion together, the sacrament given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ to proclaim his person and work until that day that he should return. May you be reminded that your marriage is a sacrament as well. Proclaiming Jesus' marriage to each of us as we long to be joined together with him for all eternity. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul shares this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night which he was betrayed, took bread. And he had given thanks, and he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is the cup, this cup is in the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Father, we do commit to you, Exon and Lindsay, as they take this communion together and their oneness in each other and their oneness in you. We ask that you would continue to bless them, that you would draw them closer to each other as they grow closer to you. And ultimately, as they go forward in marriage today, that you would use them to proclaim your gospel to a world that desperately needs you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Because you have given yourselves to one another by solemn vow and by the giving and receiving of rings, I pronounce you husband and wife in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ said, What God has joined together, let no man separate. Exon, you may kiss your breath. 